going to switch to the next module. And again, that was supposed to be Aaron Fox. So I think it's going to be myself and perhaps Holly um, jumping in here to kind of to, to wing it again. But I think, you know, the other thing is that William in some ways gave us a good segue to what, you know, Aaron calls relational organizing. And it really is exactly that, relating to people on a human scale. And I'm going to share screen. And instead of doing the presentation, you know, if we had been able to do this in person, um, we would have had copies of this worksheet that we would have distributed and had you actually think about these things. And so I'm going to give people a few minutes to think about answers to these questions. And we're going to talk about relational organizing, um, which is really just a fancy term for relating to people. And I'm sorry, Charlene, I see that you had your hand raised. Um, maybe we'll get your comment in in a minute. Um, but, you know, thinking about how you relate to people on that human scale, who do you know, who are the people that they know, and sort of snowball effect, building your base and getting the word out that way. So I'm gonna give people a few minutes to think about the answers that they would have to these three questions on the screen. Um, so I'm just, I'll read them aloud in case anyone can't see them. Um, one is think about a green candidate that you support. Why would your friends, family, colleagues, and neighbors like this candidate? What would be appealing to them about the candidate and their campaign? So that's question number one. And feel free to put answers in the chat box. Um, how often do you talk about politics and issues with the people who are closest to you? When you have these discussions, what is most important to others? Do they care about specific issues, character traits, or ideologies? And the last one is think about people you know who are willing to act according to your recommendation about a candidate. They could be anyone you have influence with. Write a list of six people that you think you can persuade to help a campaign. So I'm going to give people four minutes to write down some quick notes to that. Um, and then we will discuss and keep going with this section on relational organizing. Thank you. The Jeopardy music or the background music in your own head since that is not something that I don't think we have the capability of just yet. more time or should we start chatting? I don't know why I find these difficult to answer. Hmm. Well that itself is something to talk about. Yeah. The, the difficulty comes, I guess, from 
knowing that you believe the universe operates a certain way and the first thing you have to do to get people on board with your campaign and your issues is to communicate that effectively to people who maybe haven't seen it that way. Sure. And then all that's right. sort of um, a blanket answer for all three of them, I suppose. And then that, that's the first obstacle. Definitely. Um, so I see Beverly, um, or is that Jeff, is, who wanted to talk, to put their answers in. And then I don't know, Charlene, if your comment is still relevant, if you wanted to get on stack still. How you doing? Hey, Jeff, how are you? Okay, uh, you could probably see it on the posting. Um, I noticed that Howie, in some ways, when he was in New York, related as a UPS worker on loading trucks, related to the other, and union, rank and file union members that noticed Dario has uh, brought in people, you know, young, attracted a lot of young voters. And um, that's what I like about his campaign. And um, as far as the politics and issues, I talk about it every day. My mother's a diehard Democrat. You know, she's, she actually voted for Howie three times in New York for governor and came to one of two of his fundraisers when he was running for governor in the past. Um, as far as debt, but my mother is still on, she's still afraid of that whole issue right there. And I had to explain to her. So that said, the best way to get to other people, you get the disenfranchised voters that don't come out to vote. And you get them, you say, hey, this person represents us this way. You need to be an everyday person like myself. I clean buildings. I'm a, I'm a person that's been, that was currently furloughed and I'm still waiting for my benefits to come in, my unemployment benefits. And what Congress failed to do for all of us was give us a national health care plan. And New York State, what they failed on the state level, they failed to legalize marijuana in a social and an economic justice aspect. And they also also failed to bring us a, a um, health, health insurance, you know, health for all of us. And as far as the third question, think about, um, wait, I can't see it because somebody just posted on chat. Oh, okay, here it is. But who, who could you influence? Who do you think would follow you in your recommendations of who to run, who to vote for? Oh, mostly minorities, um, mostly disenfranchised voters, uh, people that do not vote, who know me, people that have seen me on an everyday basis that do not come out to vote, will come out and vote. Because a lot of people come and ask me, when am I running for office? Unfortunately, in New York, they suspended the petitioning so I could not petition at the last minute, even though it was one and a half, and it wasn't safe anyway to go out and collect signatures, or else I would have been on the ballot this year for state Senate. So it's mainly minorities, it's mainly um, disenfranchised voters, because you're gonna have the anti-45 voters and you're gonna have the, the Biden voters, they're gonna vote the way they are regardless. You're not going to change their minds, but you could change and reach out to the people that do not vote, which is predominantly minorities or people that have had it with, was fed up with the two, with the system. That's who. And you talk the regular language. Like I'm an everyday person. You, you know, you, you lose people when you start talking the intellectual or the academic language. You have to be an organic intellectual and say, I'm an everyday person. I actually, when I ran the last time for state assembly, I actually had 45 supporters vote for me because what I did was, and I actually convinced two of those voters to vote for Jill Stein in the election. When I explained to them about the trickle down, I said, you know why you're paying? Because the biggest issue where I live is property taxes, high property taxes. So I said, you know, we give all these breaks to these corporations and they agree with me on that. And I say, well, cut the military budget. We don't need to spend so much on the military. And they agreed with me on that. So I said, well, if you do all that, then the states will have more money and we can cut property taxes that way. So they, so they get it. This is how you resonate with voters, potential voters. And that's what we need to do. Property right. taxes. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. It's about connecting with people and meeting them where they're at, talking with them in a language that they understand and being authentic in who you are and working with the community 
and the network that you have around you. Um, I saw Gloria on, Charlene, I wasn't sure if you wanted to be on staff mm -hmm. or if you just wanted to we, put your comment in the chat. One more thing. Um, one more thing. Jeff, because we have limited okay. time and a bunch of other people, I'm going to ask right. that you hold it for the next time. Um, so um, Charlene, if you wanted to chat and then Gloria. Hi. Um, so <laughs> it's, this is a tough question at this moment in certain ways. Um, right now, um, other than local candidates, um, the only um, uh, partisan race that I know of in our state is me. Um, so, I mean, there are some, there are some nice things people have said to me. Um, I, I am currently a local official and, and one of them said to me, you know, you can be trusted. And it's sort of a, that's a character trait thing, which I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, this person I've met face to face and, uh, you know, in town and, um, so there's sort of that general impression. I mean, we have uh, local town meetings, so we have direct democracy in our town. So people have also heard me, a few hundred people have heard me speak to different issues um, and generally seem to uh, regard my comments favorably. Um, I think some right now, though, is such a tricky time because people are so incredibly stressed out um, that, like, they don't want to listen to the radio, they don't want to talk about politics. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the, the key talking points for, for any clean and green candidate is the let's get uh, all private money out of politics. That seems to ap appeal to people across the board. Over. Great. Thank you, Charlene. Um, and Gloria, did you want to add before we move on? I wanted to comment uh, specifically on how do you talk about politics and issues with people you're closest to. Um, because what I find interesting is people want to talk about the issues that are important to them, which run the gamut, right? But I notice when it comes, sometimes when it comes down to actually when they are looking at a specific candidate or they want to talk about why they like a candidate, they kind of flip into those character trait ideology. So it's sort of a very nuanced way of having a conversation with people because you can, I think there are a lot of issues people bring up, um, you know, from, from job issues to the environment to education that it's really easy to present the Green Party's perspective on that. And I think people can respond to that. But then sometimes they go into, but I really like so-and-so for these reasons, or because they're a Republican, or because they're against that person. So I, I just find it, it's, it's, not, it's not this or that, right? right? It's a very nuanced way of having those conversations when, when I'd like to convince somebody to vote for a Green Party candidate. Right, because I think, and this is, I think, one of the struggles that we have as Greens is that we tend to focus on the platform and the policy first and foremost. Um, you know, that's why we've joined the Green Party because it's the platform that speaks to our values. And yet so much of politics is driven by personality, right? You know, like the sort of, you know, people who voted for Bill Clinton because you they felt like, oh, I can just sit down with him and have a beer, you know, like he's a regular guy <laughs> and, you know, like that kind of stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, but what about the policies? And, you know, getting people to sort of think that's a challenge. And so I think that's something that we definitely have to think about and address. Um, I want to move down more to what relational organizing actually is. And I think what I'm going to do is skip down um, to this basically, you know, 2.5 and 2.7 is that you know, we're asking people to use their social capital, so the people they know, their personal networks, to influence and ask them to support a campaign. And that, you know, in some ways, the old method was reaching out to strangers, you know, having walk lists, having phone bank lists, call lists, where you're just cold calling, knocking on doors, talking to everyone in the district. And in relational organizing, it's people reaching out to people they know and really thinking about it as a snowball effect. Um, and so it's not that you'll never have to do cold calling and you know phone banking and reaching out to strangers, 
but it's about shifting, and I would say particularly in the earlier stages of a campaign where you're trying to build as large a base as possible, you know, and then if you can build that larger base, then they can go out and do some of the, you know, knock on the doors of strangers and or just continuing to snowball and build that relational group. Um, so, you know, it's really about thinking the, about, you know, how, what are the different places that you know people and what are the communities um, that you're in, you know, whether it's a neighborhood. Um, you know, when I think about the networks that I'm relying right on right now during this time, you know, it's obviously friends and family, it's, you know, the other parents, of, you know, my children, you know, like the, my children's friends, parents, you know, who are organizing activities and things for kids to do. Um, my synagogue has actually been super helpful and supportive and not because like I'm a super religious person, but whether it's, you know, extra Zoom meetups for my kids or people, you know, it's, you know, we're mostly in the same neighborhood. So it's also like, hey, who can do this favor for someone? You know, I actually had to get my mom's cat fostered and someone in my synagogue, you know, I emailed the listserv and I was like, who can foster my mom's cat? And within a week I had three people. And so, you know, there's, we have all these different identities. Of course I'm a green, right? Like that's my other big community and there's the people I work with. And so there's all these places where I have connections um, to different groups of people, and those are the types, those are the people that we should actually be messaging first. And it really is about breaking down those walls and silos, I think. You know, I think it's hard because so much of the way we've been taught is like, oh, you know, in certain mixed company, like, don't talk about religion and don't talk about politics, right? And, but, you know, I've finally gotten to the point where I'm not necessarily walking around with my buttons and my stickers all the time, but most of the people I work with know that I'm a green and are, you know, will engage me, okay, you know, will actually like, well, what does the green party think about this? Like, they're just curious. Um, and so it's really about talking to the people that you know, and then getting in your volunteers, training them to do the same thing, to reach out. Um, so any reactions, comments, questions to this piece, um, any, I mean, I'm going to put Jay Walker on the spot as my fellow Pennsylvanian, um, because I think, you know, more so than anyone that I've seen in the party recently, like Jay is doing a phenomenal job of just reaching out to people and bringing them in. And so just the fact that I'm pretty sure he's got, I think he wrote in, me an email, like there's 10 people from Pittsburgh on this call. And if that's true, that's like close to a quarter of the people on this call um, because he made asks and he reached out and he talked to people he knows, not necessarily strangers, and said, hey, please get this training, please come on this call, please join me, like building a movement and building momentum. Um, Jay, do you want to say anything about how you've been doing that and what, I know you've been spending a lot of your COVID time doing phone banking, doing outreach, um, you know, spending time on the Green Party, and any just thoughts or reflections from all that work? And hopefully you're still there. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Um, I don't know. I think something that's really important is like not putting pressure on people. Like everyone's really busy um, and to like understand that and be respectful of that. Um, you know, uh, we're fighting the good fight, I think. Um, part of the challenges of the Green Party is people feel like the good fight is there's no way that we will win or like, you know, that it's too big of a fight. But um, if we, uh, if we set those goals in a way that's realistic for people or they can wrap their heads around it, then I think uh, they, they feel like they can be a part of it. Like we're, we're killing on the platform, right? Um, this whole Bernie Sanders movement was built on the Green Party platform. So we got that. That's good. That's locked down. Um, but it just has to like, there has to be a, a sense of viability. and. Um, different people have different uh like some people are early adopters a lot of us are early adopters other people as more pe as you gain momentum they're more likely to join in so knowing when is the right time to ask some people um is really important and then sometimes it's just sort of like why not ask someone right like what do you have to lose that's, right that's all. right i mean it they might say no but that's exactly what you would have had if you never asked them in the first place right 
Um, you know, I often had been, I've been spending a lot of time this week doing like informational interviews with people looking for jobs. And I always say, you know, apply, even if you think you're not qualified, apply anyway, right? Better to have them tell you that you're not getting the job than for you to do it for them. And it's the same way, right? Like, what have you got to lose by asking someone aside from the like three minutes of airtime that you just did? I mean, I think for some people, you know, oh, well, I don't want them to think this way about me. And it's, you know, it's not about being preachy or about being, you know, like, oh, here comes Hillary again, who only wants to talk about Green Party politics. But, you know, when, when it's appropriate and when the moment is right, you know, mention and discuss and interject and, you know, make sure that folks know. And again, all the different communities that you're a part of. Um, so just skipping down some more in some of Aaron's presentation, um, one thing, you know, he's saying in terms of time frame, which I would agree with, order of operation is to do this first. Again, try to build the network of core supporters. I mean, sometimes we, you know, start with the Green Party, start with your, the people who are most likely to support you. And then once you've got them mobilized, then you can sort of go out to larger and larger groups or people who are less and less connected. Um, and relational organizing is in some ways the same way. Um, the other thing, and maybe I skipped down, oh, 4.5, hold on, um, is, you know, thinking about how are we all connected, um, thinking about who your spheres of influence are. And it's not just about, oh, these are the groups that I happen to be in. The other thing that you want to do on your campaign is in some ways, and you know, I've seen other presentations where they call this doing a power map, um, where you're basically thinking, all right, well, who are, what are the groups in the community that we need to get on board with our campaign? Who are the key, who are the influential organizations and people that if they came out and endorsed my campaign, like that would really make a difference. And then you think about like, well, who do we know that's in that circle? Who do we know that's part of that community organization? Or if it's the local DSA chapter or the local chapter of, you know, whatever, like who do we know that will influence this other community and how do we sort of map our relationships? Um, the other thing that I want to borrow from another training that a few of us did is, um, you know, thinking about, and those influencers might be what we call authentic leaders. And so these are not necessarily people who have the title or the position, but who, if this is the person that says, oh, I think so-and-so is a good candidate, 10 other people will listen, right? And so in a church, it might, you know, it may not be the preacher, it may not be the priest, but it could be the president of, you know, the men's club, or it could be just a really influential, influential parishioner. And the way you find out that information is by asking the people that you know, like, if you said, hey, Hillary, if we wanted, if, you know, who would be the most influential person in your synagogue, I could probably give you three or four names of people who seem to have, who are known widely, who seem to have influence, and they may or may not have official roles of leadership. So it's also about sort of mapping, you know, the ecosystem of relationships in your community and thinking about who do you know, who are part of these other organizations that we're trying to bring into the party, if that makes sense. Um, comments, questions, thoughts on that. And I'm curious if anybody has tried to do this, have had, you know, key endorsements in campaigns or tried to get key endorsements in campaigns and maybe came up short. Um, how does this jive with your lived experience on campaigns? Holly, is that you chiming in? No, it was me trying to get a bigger picture. <laughs> <laughs> I would mention one thing. Uh, somebody wrote in who's on the phone. We have a number of people who are phoning in. And uh, it might help, now um, you called on uh, Jay, but uh, others when we start to speak may um, announce our names so that those on the phone might, might hear who we are. That'd be great. All right, any other 
questions or comments about this topic. Um, if not, I will move on. Um, certainly you can also think about how to do this um, recruiting and organizing around issues. And so there are clearly groups of people and networks and associations that are focused on issues, you know, whether it's the Sierra Club or, you know, other types of um, voting groups, um, you know, welfare rights organizations, all kinds of things. And so, you know, but I think you, you need to think about both issue organizations that connect with our policies and our platform, but also thinking about more neighborhood-based civic organizations who maybe don't already identify with our platform and how can we sort of make that bridge. Um, I see Travis has raised his hand. So Travis, you wanna go next? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to um, add to the power map idea, which is, I think, one of the most important, like, early phases of a campaign, and, and it's, like, one of the um, things you have to do, is uh, I think the best way to approach that is rather than going up to all the, the influential people and saying, hey, I want you to support my campaign, it, instead, I think the better way to do that is to basically reach out to those people and say, hey, I need, I need people to advise me on policy and I wanna listen from you on, please like tell me what issues I need to be raising and uh, help, help like, you know, advise my campaign on what, what do you want to see out of my campaign? Uh, because those people, uh, and you can even formalize it. You can even say like, uh, we, um, you know, you can be on like my policy council or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, because I think that the, the best way to do it is to say like, this is, this is your campaign. Like you, you own this, uh, you know, as, as the candidate, my job is to basically uh, raise the issues that, that you want me to. No, that's great. I mean, I'm reminded of, you know, what Jill Stein did, I think in 2012, and then again in 2016 with her shadow cabinet, right? It was a way, is a sort of a very visible way of showing, you know, here are some influential people who have expertise in particular areas, and these are the folks who are advising me. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great way, you know, like, it, it can't be a one-way conversation of like, hey, here's me and my needs, what can you do for me? But also, you know, what can we be doing for you? How can we give visibility to an issue that you care about um, by making it a key part of this campaign? Um, and so I think, you know, you make a, a really good point, Travis. Um, I think, you know, the other thing, of course, to, that goes without saying, and I think it's 5.1 here, let me move my chat box, is obviously start with the candidates' personal network um, and their organizations and affiliations, um, but also it's your volunteers, it's the other people on your campaign. I mean, I think the other thing, and you know, to think about is what, you know, who do we choose to even run for office in the first place? And, you know, I know here in Philly, we've had a couple of times where people get excited and they want to run for office. and they really don't have any network, any, you know, like they, it's like literally the first thing that they want to do is run for office. And, you know, we've had to counsel some people to possibly maybe wait and not run for office this year until they have a little bit more, you know, of a following, of a base. Like, have you, what have you actually done in the community? You know, where have you demonstrated leadership before? that then leads people to say, oh, this person should be on city council versus like just waking up one morning and saying like, oh, I wanna run for city council because that seems like a cool thing to do. And so I think, you know, it's a both end, really cultivating, um, you know, we, you can grow leadership, like leadership is not inherent, but also, you know, realizing that it, it matters and how folks relate to others and, you know, the type of work that they've done in the past and the networks they can rely on certainly go a long way. Um, 
Okay, so let's, um, I think, finish it up here. We have seven more minutes in this section. Um, you know, obviously, events are a little harder to come by these days as points of entry, but, you know, conversations can still happen. And so, like, just earlier today, because Jay is the organizing, you know, whiz in Pennsylvania, um, were you, was it you, Jay, who gave us this other contact, Justin? I don't know, I got an email. It's like, hey, I'm in Philly. I'm interested in the Green Party. Um, I, maybe I think everything comes from Jay now. I don't know. But, you know, he reached out to a few of us, and I just wrote back to him, and I said, you know, like, in normal times, I would invite you to go get a cup of coffee and just, like, meet and just, like, meet you and figure out, like, what is it that you want to do? And, you know, how can we get you involved in the Green Party? And, um, and I said, you know, but maybe we can just do a video chat instead, right? Like, even though we can't do things the way, like, talk in the place that we normally would have doesn't mean that we can't have the same conversation. Um, I think the other thing is that you will realize that this can be a very time intensive and labor intensive process, right? And so best practice is to really do this at the beginning, right? I mean, like you could start this now for a campaign next year for a 2021 race is start like talking to your neighbors, talking to your social circle, talking to everyone you know, what are the issues that you care about? What would motivate you to run to vote for a Green Party candidate? If I ran for office next year, would I have your support? You know, those are the kinds of like preliminary conversations that you could be having now for, you know, next year. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little too much to sort of do all that in the next five months, unless you're talking about a very small local race. Um, but, you know, it is the type of thing that I think is worth it investing some time in. Um, so, um, any other comments or questions about this relational organizing piece? Well, Hillary, I want to mention something that I saw in the chat. I think it was Beth Scroggin that wrote this, um, but just mentioning some of the things that Jay does that, um, can reach out to supporters but also volunteers but using texting to follow up with people making sure that he follows up and using a slack channel to engage volunteers uh, so that people know that they're um that they're working and that they're valued and i think that is important too but both for volunteers and as someone who lives in iowa pre pre-caucus i was getting a text like every half hour from one campaign or another so it does um uh, for, for reaching to supporters and both volunteers, that's another thing to think about, making sure that people are engaged. Great. Um, so I think what I'm going to do, since we have three minutes before our next module, where we're going to have um, Felena Farley, who is the treasurer of the Ohio Green Party, and probably three other hats that I don't know about, who's actually going to talk about campaign websites. Um, and other technology um, and give my voice a break, which is great. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put folks back into random breakouts to do some more introductions because we have a bunch of new people on the call since we first started a couple hours ago. Um, and that'll give us a little buffer between this presentation and the next one. So I'm going to put you in breakouts if you're on the computer. And you'll have about five minutes to sort of introduce yourself, say who you are, where you're from, you know, whether you have Green Party campaign experience, etc. And then we'll kick it off in like four minutes. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating today. I don't know what the weather here in Philly is very sunny and beautiful, but pretty cold and frigid. Amazing. Cold here, too. Yeah, but somewhere I'm sure it's nice. Um, so thank you for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. All right, here come the breakout rooms. <laughs>